Good evening, everyone. We greet you again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we seek to worship, praise, and glorify him this evening at Smyrna Presbyterian Church, may you find your hearts refreshed in the eternal fountain of divine blessing. Would you stand for our call to worship? Our call to worship this evening comes from Isaiah 12, verses 5 and 6. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let us now remain standing for our hymn of the month in Christ alone, found in your bulletins. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love. And righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. This bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the Join me in prayer. Our God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give great praise and thanks knowing that as we just sang, Christ alone saves us. That is nothing of ourselves. We are thankful for this truth, for he is the truth, the way, and the life. And no one can come to you, Father, apart from him. We therefore pray, Father, in your great love and mercy, would you condescend once more and show forth your very presence this evening in our midst. I ask this for all your people gathered here. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Our scripture memory verse for this month comes to us from Psalm 90, 1 through 2, which you can found, find in your bulletins or in your pew Bible on page 835. Please read it loud with me. Lord, you have been in our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Please be seated. Join me in prayer. Oh, Father God, how beautiful and wonderful it is to be in your house tonight. For better is just one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And we would rather be doorkeepers in the house of our God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Father, you are our sun and shield, giving grace and glory, favor and honor. You do not withhold any good thing from those who walk blamelessly, which we can only do in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. O great God of angel armies, how blessed indeed are those who trust in you. We thank you, Father, that even in our suffering, you truly work all things out for good for those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. For those you foreknew, you predestined to be conformed to the image of your Son, so that he might be the first among many brethren. And not only that, Father, but those you predestined for this purpose, you called and you justified, and you glorified. To these things, how can we help but respond that if you are for us, who could possibly be against us? Lord Jesus, we therefore plead that you make it possible for us, fallen sinners redeemed by your grace and loving kindness, to live in a manner that pleases you. Help us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to be washed and sanctified to avoid sexual immorality, to not take advantage of our brothers and sisters, but instead live holy lives, to aspire to live quietly, minding our own affairs and working with our hands so that we might walk properly in front of those outside of the church and not be in need. We wish to be free of all debts except that of love, which will continue on into your eternal kingdom. We place our faith and hope in this kingdom to come, in you, Lord Jesus, King above all kings, in our living hope through the power of your resurrection. So, Lord, we come humbly, yet with boldness, to your throne of grace tonight to offer up prayers and petitions for the needs of our church, this church that belongs to you. Lord, we pray for our pastors, Joel Smith and Danny Myers, and the well-being of their families. Would you continue to grant them wisdom and comfort so that they might continue to minister to our congregation with that wisdom and comfort in both days of weeping and days of rejoicing? Would you continue to likewise equip our elders and deacons for sound decision-making and a continued spirit of self-sacrificing love, spurring on our whole congregation towards greater acts of charity and giving? We pray for the inquirer's class so that the Holy Spirit would enlighten those contemplating membership here at SPC. We thank you for the blessing of the many ministries of the church, the women of the word, the keenagers, the prayer shawl ministry, the men's fellowship, large and small groups. We pray for the children's and youth ministries, such that more young minds would be able to taste and see that you are good. So we thank you for the recent youth camping retreat and pray for our upcoming VBS week at SPC. We pray for our Oasis ministry and our missions team. We pray for those suffering loss and ongoing health issues. In all this, we thank you, Lord God, knowing that you can do much more than we can ever imagine. It's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit that we pray. Amen. Would you stand for the hymn of the month? It's found in your bulletins. It's uh, hymn number 92, actually, in the pew hymnals. It's A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Amen. If you remain standing and turn to Psalm 46 this night, that's the reason why we sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. If you did not know that, Luther took that song from this psalm, Psalm 46. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord. Come, he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Thus far, the reading of God's word. You may be seated. I'm a big fan, and perhaps you are as well, of the miniseries Band of Brothers. Specifically, the leader of that band of brothers, Dick Winters, the commander of the Easy Company of the 101st Airborne. And there was a book that came out by Major Winters, specifically of his leadership and of his leadership style. And he admits in that book that it was not always bravery and courage that got him through it. He writes, I'm not ashamed to admit that fear was a principal factor that contributed to my success as a leader. I was always afraid, afraid of letting my men down, afraid of dying. It was a combination of these fears that drove me to learn everything I could about my profession so I could bring as many of my men home from war as possible. Fear indeed is a powerful motivator. It can be used either to paralyze and to incapacitate, or it can be used to spur us on and to provoke and to motivate. Similar circumstances, similar fears, and yet two seemingly opposite responses. Well, what makes the difference between the one being frozen in fear versus being motivated by that fear to move in action? I think it's having the information, the truth, that is bigger than your fear. Again, Major Winters in that book, Beyond the Band of Brothers, writes this, the big problem for a leader is keeping his wits and not freezing in fear, being able to think and do so as soon as possible and talking to the men and getting them to get up and to think. You hear what he is saying. You cannot get fixated on the fear Rather, you must know what you need to know in that moment and therefore do what you must do. You have to keep thinking. To put that in biblical terms, I would say you have to keep meditating on the truth that is bigger than your fears. I believe that the psalmist of Psalm 46, one of the sons of Korah, would come to a similar conclusion. He does not deny fear or worry or anxiety, but he states and states very clearly that there is something bigger, much bigger than our fears and the things that we can worry, and that is God himself. If we know our God, if we know his character, then we need not fear. Therefore, this is a a wonderful psalm of hope and confidence. As I mentioned, this was Luther's psalm, from it comes that mighty fortress is our God, that battle hymn of the Reformation. The choir, if you didn't notice, 
sang a, a rendition of Psalm 46 this morning. And so it is a well-used and a well-beloved psalm. And hopefully it's more than just Luther's psalm. It becomes our psalm, the song of the church, placing our hope fully and finally in God alone. We'll see this night that there are three stanzas to this hymn, to this song, and in many ways they repeat and build upon each other and have very similar themes. And so those three stanzas are our three points for tonight. The sanctuary in storms, the constant in chaos, and the calm in confusion. First, the sanctuary in storms. As the psalmist begins, he poses a hypothetical that we will not fear, though, or perhaps you could say, even if the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and form, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. You might read that and think, hold on a second, psalmist. We will not fear, though the earth open up, and swallow us whole like it did with Korah and Dathan and Abihu. We shall not fear if the mountains get thrown into the sea. I know we're not very familiar with mountains here in Georgia, but if you've been to the Appalachians or up to the Rockies, then you know how massive these mountains are. The mountains be picked up like a pebble and thrown into the sea. If the waters start to roar and foam like a pot of boiling water on the stove, if the mountains quake and tremble and become like a dust heap, in other words, if everything just comes to an end, all things that we know as everyday events ceases to take place, and these items happen, these items that we would see as world-ending events, that the world is truly coming to an end. That is the, what the psalmist poses in this psalm. This is the scenario that he gives us, and in many cases, it's the, the worst-case scenario, the world-ending scenario, situations that anyone and everyone would rightfully be fearful and afraid. In fact, if these things took place, everyone would be equally freaked out. But even during such chaos, the worst of chaos, the psalmist says, we will not fear. Why? Why would you not? It seems like it would be a, a good reason to fear. Well, we do not fear because of the constant refrain, the chorus of this psalm. Notice how it begins. We will not fear because God is our refuge and our strength. God is our refuge. The Hebrew word is masse. It's a beautiful word. It means shelter. In our day and age, we do not appreciate good shelter because we always have it, do we not? This week, we had a pop-up thunderstorm in the middle of the night. Many of you are probably saying, we did? When was this? What night? We didn't even recognize it. We didn't even realize it. You, you perhaps didn't even wake up. You slept through it. And why is that? Because you had good shelter, right? You're protected from the wind and the rain and from the lightning. None of those things bothered you. Like I said, you probably slept through it or perhaps woke up from the flashes of lightning, but soon went back to sleep. But what if you were outside? If you're on or in an open field or on a mountainside watching sheep or traveling, it would not be just nothing, would it? Storms would pose a, a risk. It would even be life-threatening. And so what would it mean in such a storm, such a situation to find an, an alcove or a, a cave in the mountainside? Shelter from the 
storm, a, a refuge from the wind and the waves and, or the rain and, and protection from the, the elements. Though we do not know what it means to have physical shelter like we should, do we know what it means to have spiritual shelter when those metaphorical pop-up storms take place in your life? Do you know what it means for the Lord to be your refuge? Do you know what it means for him to be your shelter? Or are we frantically looking around to the things of this earth to be our refuge, to be our shelter, finances or friends or family? Yes, those may be aids. Perhaps those would be wonderful helps, but they are not like the Lord. He is the true shelter because he is a refuge and then as the psalmist says, a a strength. Luther calls it a bulwark that is never failing. True strength, a, a true firm foundation. That's what Jesus says as well when the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when he is concluding, when he is wrapping up, he says that everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, we know that God and God's word is our, our refuge, our rock, our bulwark that is never failing. Not only because of who he is, obviously that, because of his character, but also because what he has done. And that is indeed what the second line says. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I probably prefer a a very proven help, a well-proven help. As we read the pages of Scripture, God is indeed that very present help or that well-proven help, not to let his people suffer or to struggle beyond that which is necessary. And he always comes through. He is always reliable. It might be in the 11th hour, so to speak, but he is never slow to act. He never fails to act. As we think of our favorite Bible stories, that is surely true, isn't it? Every time the the conclusion could be that God is faithful. And the same is true in our lives as well. If we think of the troubles and difficulties that have come our way, if we think about the the past, so we can all testify that God is a well-proven help, a very present help in trouble, time and time again. My grandfather, who's deceased and has gone on to be with the Lord, was a Ford man. He always bought Fords. He always drove a Ford truck. And if you remember what the Ford truck slogan is, it's built Ford tough, right? And so what does the commercials depict? They depict Ford trucks going through the the worst of conditions, plowing through the snow and the mud and major thunderstorms, going over tree limbs or towing big, heavy loads and trailers. What is the likelihood that if you have a Ford truck that you're going to use your truck for any of those things? The likelihood is zero to none, especially most of you that have trucks. I've seen how you treat your trucks. Your trucks barely touch gravel, let alone go off-road. They're like giant cars. But what is the idea behind the commercial? The not so subtle message that there is a reliability. There is a, a toughness to this vehicle that it can make it through any circumstance, any scenario, and you can do so with a, a Ford truck. Not that you would have to, but if you needed to, you could. So, just in case there's a five foot snowstorm here in Georgia, you'll be ready. You can go barreling through the snow or have a giant concrete block drop into the the bed of your 
Ford truck. What's the point? The point is this, if these trucks are tough, how much more our God? Is there anything more tough, more reliable, more dependable than our God? Of course not. He is a very present help, a well-proven help in times of trouble. That even though the earth would give way, though the mountains be thrown into the heart of the sea, even then we will not fear. Why? God is our refuge and strength and help. Who amongst us tonight needs to hear that message? I would say all of us. No chaos break out and break upon us. God is what we stand in need of. He is indeed the one that is with us amidst the storms of life and is that shelter. Second, we have the constant in chaos. Again, the psalmist does not hide from the trouble of the world. This is not pie in the sky. This is not kumbaya type theology. This is not happy thoughts. We're going to ignore anything bad that is taking place in the world, any bad acts or deeds that are done on the earth. No, the psalmist makes it very clear that the nations rage, that the kingdoms totter, that there is war and warfare. And that is true this day as much as it was true the day that the psalmist wrote this, right? There's never been a time on earth that the nations have not raged one against another. I always somewhat inwardly chuckle that the United Nations was formed, I believe, at the end of World War II. And their purpose was so that there would be peace on earth. And that there would be no warfare ever again. Well, there's never been a day of peace or a time where there has not been war since the formation of the UN. The nations have raged. They do rage. There has been war and warfare. The kingdoms come and go. But what is the one constant? The one constant is God himself. He does not come and go. He cannot be replaced or overthrown. He does not get wore down or or become weary. He does not change. He, He need not change. He is perfect. He is the one that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, he is faithful. The philosophers call it the unmoved mover, the one that is constant, that causes all the rest to move. He is the cause of all the rest. And that is God himself. Everything falls out under his effect. And ultimately, not just randomly, not chaotically, but as a result of his care and providence upon the earth. Chapter 5 of the Westminster Confession of Faith says that God, the creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose and govern all creatures, their actions and things from the greatest even to the least. Do you hear that? The greatest of all acts, the greatest of worldwide acts to the smallest of acts, the hair falling from your head this night, the things that you do not even notice or would even take notice, God takes notice of because it's a part of his providential care upon the earth. That is the one thing that is always the same. Amidst all the change and the changing season of life, God is good to remain the same. And therefore, he gives what is needed in season to us that are in constant change. As the psalmist says, he is the river whose streams make glad the city of God. Many commentators believe that this psalm was written during the days of of Hezekiah. And if you've been to Jerusalem, if you've been able to take a a trip there, then you know that one of the highlights in the city of Jerusalem is the Hezekiah's tunnels. It's a series of tunnels that were built during Hezekiah's day for, for water to come into the city. You can think of it as kind of underground plumbing 
And you can walk through those tunnels to this very day. And if you go to Jerusalem, I encourage you to do so. It's, it's quite an interesting part of the, the tour of the city. The purpose was if the, the city was to be surrounded, like it was actually during Hezekiah's day with Sennacherib, that the vital water which was needed would not be cut off, that it would be a, a source of, of strength. And obviously that water would be given, uh, would give gladness to the city in such a time as that. That's, in a sense, what the writer is speaking of here. That the Lord is our gladness. He is this river that is needed, that restores, that refreshes, even in the midst of chaos. That our constant is that he gives in season what we stand in need of. And this is largely done by his presence. You notice that in this second stanza, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Again, verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. We as New Covenant believers know this better than even the psalmist or the Israelites of who is this one that is with us. We know his name to be Emmanuel, God with us. That Jesus is that one who is, never leaves us or forsakes us. He's the one that gives us the Holy Spirit so as to not leave us as orphans. In many ways, this stanza reminds us of Psalm chapter 1. That the righteous are like trees planted by streams of water. They yield its fruit in season. Its leaf will not wither. Whatever he does, no matter what the outside circumstances are taking place, it could be hot or it could be drought, it could be storm. The psalmist says that he prospers, he or she prospers. Why? Because they are planted by those streams of water. So indeed, God is that constant in our life that gives that comfort to us. Well, third, we see calm and confusion. Again, I know I sound like a, a broken record, but notice in verse 9, he speaks of wars and bows and spears and chariots. Modern day would be tanks and jets and nuclear weapons, perhaps. The weaponry has changed, but the intention has not. That the world is in strife, it's in conflict first with God and then with one another. But the Lord is not unaware. He is not ignorant. And so therefore the psalmist says, well, come, behold, the works of the Lord. He's brought desolation on the earth. He brings the earth to nothing. He shows how small the earth really is and how even the mightiest of men are as nothing. He is the one that makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He's the one that breaks the, the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. He is the one that will bring the ultimate peace upon this earth. We know that he does this first and foremost through his salvation, giving us peace with God, ending that conflict, ending our enmity with God. But one day he will put a cease to all of the war and all the world's conflicts. And so therefore the psalmist says, come and behold his works. And then one of the best lines in the entirety of this psalm, really perhaps one of the, my favorite lines in the entirety of the Psalter, it's found there in verse 10, be still, be still and know that I am God. We oftentimes hear this verse in the context of quiet times with the, the Lord, that you should be still and have peace and be with the Lord, be in, in a place where without chaos. But I don't think that's quite the intention of the psalmist. I believe what the psalmist is saying here sounds more like this. Stop it. Hush. Be quiet. Relax. It's much like if you have children 
You use this line quite often, do you not? When you're sitting at the dinner table and the bickering starts to happen, one with another, sibling to sibling, and it starts to get amped up higher and higher until they're just at each other, and then finally you've had enough and you say, stop it, knock it off, be still, be quiet. That is the tenor of this line. That God the Father is a good Father should rightly rebuke us. When we get worked up, when we get into a frenzy over the circumstances of life, what is going on, what is going to take place, how can I make this all work, and how is it all going to come together, and we begin to get frantic and begin to go into a tizzy and perhaps even hyperventilate at some points. The Lord breaks in and says, stop it. Be quiet. Be still. Why? Because our worrying can really demonstrate our faithlessness. As God says to us, be still, child. Hush. Shh. Know that I am God. Not you, me. I am God. I got it covered. I have it under control. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be glorified in the earth. Notice, not I might or I may be, I will be. That is, is all working out towards my ends, towards my means, for the thing that I have ordained it to do so that I may be exalted, that I may be glorified throughout all of my creation, in all things, in every circumstances, even in your circumstance. And so these things that work us up, that, that worry us, that, that trouble us, even in this, God will demonstrate that he is God and that we are not and that we need not worry. Rather, we need to be still. We need to hush and be quiet. And that is true for all areas of life, but it's especially true for his children, for his church, for his people. Listen again to what the Westminster Confession of Faith says on the chapter of providence. It says, the providence of God does in general reach to all creatures, but after a most special manner, it takes care of his church and disposes all things to the good thereof. That's just another way of saying Romans 8, 28, that God works all things to the good of those that are loved and called according to his purposes. We saw that this morning, didn't we not? With this Jerusalem council, where there was division, where there was dissension, there was strife, a divide. And yet, what was the end result? God used it to strengthen his church, to bless his church, so his church would rejoice, that they would be encouraged, that there would be ultimate unity and peace. What the world intended for evil, God will use for good. Again, he will do that, not just in a church level, but an individual level in our own life. And so, be still. Heart, mind, soul, be still. Sometimes we need to say that to ourselves. As Psalm 131 speaks of, the psalmist says, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Like a child resting in his mother's arms without a care or concern in the world. That all is right. So too we come to the Lord knowing that he cares for us like a mother would care for for us. Well, I'll end with this. There is some artistic beauty in this psalm as you read it. Notice that in the beginning and middle and the end, there is this similar refrain. You see it at the very beginning, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help and trouble. And then verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress and then again, verse 11 is repeated. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our 
fortress. In many ways, what the psalmist is doing, he's demonstrating a a fortress-like analogy here in this psalm. At at the very beginning and in the middle and in the end, the same constant refrain is there that God is in our midst, that God is with us. He is our strength. He is our refuge. He is our fortress. I love going into new construction. Before they put up the the drywall and you see all the wood and you really see the the bones of the the house and see how the structure of the house is holding everything together and and you see the the walls and you see the floor joists and if you know anything about construction, which I know very little, but I know enough of construction to know this, that, that floor joists, especially if they're on a second story or third story, can only go so far before they need a a support beam, before they need a supporting wall. And that's what the psalmist is saying here, right? That this mighty fortress, this one that is our God, has strong walls. He is a strong support beam at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end. In every circumstance, he will show himself to be faithful. In every area of life, if you be at the the beginning of your life or in the middle of your life or at the the end of your life, he supports us wholly. He is the structure that keeps it all together. He is that, that refuge and strength and fortress. He is with us. And so we as New Testament believers know that better than anyone Doth ask who that may be? Christ Jesus. It is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name. From age to age the same. He must win the battle. This is a wonderful psalm of hope and confidence in the midst of weariness and fear. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in times of trouble. We are told that often during the Reformation, when the days were dark and it would be easy to get discouraged and depressed with what was taking place and it would seem that the the, the lies were winning out and the side of truth was being pummeled and that victory was far away, especially during those times. Martin would say to his, Martin Luther, that is, to his good companion, his good friend, Philip Melanchthon, he would say, come on, Philip, let's sing the 46th. And they would spelt out these lines, this wonderful truth from this psalm. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Indeed it is. God is our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. He is our God. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful psalms that, that bolster us, that strengthen us, Lord, that remind us, especially during times when our faith is weak, that it's not on the basis of our faith or even our faithfulness, O Lord, but on the basis of the fact that you, O God, are the one that strengthen us and give us the faith that we need. And so, Lord, we are people that admit that we lack faith. We are weak in faith. We believe, but we would ask that you would help our our unbelief, O Lord, which is so often, which is so constant. So, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful psalm that you've given to the church that we need not fear, for you are with us. You have given us your presence, that you are our refuge, our strength, indeed, our fortress in times of trouble. And so, Lord, would we run and find refuge in you alone, find refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his salvation, and be reminded that all things will work together for the good, of those that are loved and called according to your purpose. For you're working all things out, Lord, for your end, that you would be exalted 
amongst the nations. You will be exalted in the earth. And we must only be still and know that you are God. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful truth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let us sing another rendition of Psalm 46. It's found in your hymnal, your Trinity hymnal, in number 40. God is our refuge and strength. Let us rise to sing. Indeed, as you go forth this week, would you be reminded of these wonderful truths? And as you go, would you go forth with the blessing of God because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Would you this night go forth and be still and know the peace of God, that he indeed is our God, that he will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. And may he be exalted in our lives as well. Go with the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.